the hero called DNA. In today's episode, or Friday late night's episode, I was wondering about the heroic archetype, and I wondered about how many human beings in the past or currently alive in the present or even <clears throat> the unborn future, how many human beings will stare upon this archetype as a sort of landmark that they pass through the karma of their lifetime, the heroic archetype. and. It was very, I think the thing that interested me about talking about this is that on some level we have an evolutionary survival oriented DNA program kind of, you know, repeating itself on the surface of the planet. And from another angle we have the humanized cultural cycles, like the, uh, the humanized cultural view <clears throat> that, in some sense, the heroic archetype really, its value comes, you know, it's as if, like, when we look at a creature surviving, it's as if we don't consider it as a hero, but when it's a conscious action done, then it's, like, suddenly heroic. And so pretty much this idea of the hero, and really, the hero at the end of the day, it's like our DNA, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's like somebody's like, my DNA is heroic, you know. I may potentially be the first person ever to have said that statement, you know. <laughs> the heroic effort of the DNA to keep an abstract potential of a real world alive. You know, <clears throat> there is this view that when we look back at the world, it was a simpler place, you know, even be prior to cultures and stuff, you know, and in some sense, from this simplicity, it's, it's like, how is the world changing? And it's changing through a revelation of complexity, right? So, in some sense, like, if we had a sort of aerial, abstract, let's say, omniscient view, and for a moment we were like, okay, what has happened on this planet? right <clears throat> or what is happening in this universe it's as if a part of the universe has noticed itself and it's this hilarious thing where it's like earth separated itself uh, from itself and then the human consciousness arose and now the human consciousness lives for the unity of nature like i find this very fascinating right that we are it's as if we <clears throat> Yeah, we are kind of like, you know, I think walking dirt is not a humble thing to say. <laughs> you know, imagine somebody's like, Mr. What they've called human beings walking dirt. <laughs> it's either like evolutionary walking dirt or kind of theological sculpted clay. It's like, you know, okay. <laughs> There's so many stories we give to reality, but on some level it's like a real event happening and our relationship with it brings forth the abstract really. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that the universe seemed to be a simpler place. And if we just saw this current complexity, we'd be like, okay, first it was just, let's say, Earth intelligence. And then the Earth, part, again, there was a sort of separation of creature, but to me, like this is kind of a bold statement but to me creaturehood is alien like to me at the, I don't know how to say this we, we associate it to this earth but on some part of me feels it's like the earth is uh, receiving instructions from light right to me I feel light is programming manifestation 
okay? And we do consider it like to be an energy carrier system. So let's say that what it is carrying is in some sense a sort of geometrical blueprint of behavior. <clears throat> but again, this is going into my personal theories on what I, you know, why I feel the sun is shining in our eyes. But, but, I'll, but, I'll, but I'll say, I'll go back to this, that I'm trying to say that it's like it's, it, it, it's this unique story where the universe was just being itself and some part of itself separated from itself to notice it and now its relationship of love and hate and all the emotions come from the relationship of a self with the world. You know, it, it's like this kind of question where the person wonders, like, what has DNA been building through the lineage of my manifestation, right? So it's as if like a person wondering, what was the life purpose of all my ancestors? And sure, a simple answer is for us to be here. But from another angle, to me, it feels like there is a field of intelligence and it's moving the particles and it has given an opportunity for the particle to, to assume it is moving reality. Really what it is, is all of life, a lot of people look for the meaning of life, but it's like you're lo looking for the meaning of a changing movement, you know. It's a movement, okay? And when we become conscious of it, we copy-paste or we multiply this dualistic relationship we have and we see it through everything, right? So it's pretty much like the world just being here that's unconscious. Suddenly creature arrives, self enters world, suddenly self is conscious of the world. And then when self tries to survive in the world, still, let's say, this evolving self in the world through survey, it's like surviving. <clears throat> and then something unique happens through the, the integration of the psychology of the tribe. When human beings began forming groups, it was as if like that was the first attempts, earliest attempts as a group mind. Okay. And really what it is, is a tribe is a manifestation. It's like the outer realm expression of a collective mind. Really societies, nations, even in the future, there's going to be an incredible global allegiance. Pretty much what's gonna happen in the future is like the species that may make a bunch of mistakes. It's gonna freak out the smartest people on the planet. And then the smartest people on the planet, do you know, maybe, how would I tell you? <clears throat> it's pretty much you activate the hearts uh, of the smart people and the smart people activate the minds of those who haven't cared to see how intelligent they are. There's no such thing as stupid people really. What it is, it's like it's all an awareness where like moments of being that are present, you know, <clears throat> only in contrast to other events there comes a relativity of like, okay, what's the intelligence factor? Right, and even nowadays, like you, you read articles about psychology, it's like there's so many different types of intelligence. Why? Because for now, human beings are judging intelligence spends based on result. You know, <clears throat> it's as if like imagine there's a game. Whoever scores a goal in this game is like we're saying like that's the smartest person. But on some level. The person, both players, let's say there's two players and whoever scores a goal first wins. <coughs> what I'm trying to say is that ability is everywhere. Every DNA is making a new, new entrance into the realm. We're so different in our designs and conditioning that we cannot be compared. And ultimately, regardless of whatever ego we have, it's the movement of the DNA behind the scenes. You know, biological existence seems to be the preoccupation of man. So what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> when this biological existence 
unconscious biological existence turned into conscious uh, abstract experience or conscious subjective experience that inner realm possibility could create emotions pretty much you know, the idea of the hero requires the idea of imagination <coughs> I'm gonna bring the notepad out here hopefully it has enough battery So, So if I was to explain this, <clears throat> the hero called DNA, literally I'm saying heroic context before a heroic concept. That's the main idea. So the whole, this whole episode is about this, the heroic context before a heroic concept, and oh my god, my handwriting is like, like an ancient, forgotten language. You know? <laughs> Here I'll read this for the viewers, just to have a sort of, it's a step on starting point. The concept of a hero, the dictionary says a person who is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements or noble qualities, the chief male character in a book, play or movie who is typically identified with good qualities and with whom the reader is expected to sympathize. <clears throat> I think it's just, here it says the dictionary says the chief male character, but I would say it's like just the main character is like kind of the hero uh, in mythology and folklore a person of superhuman qualities and often semi-divine origin in particular one in particular one whose exploits were the subject of ancient Greek myths so for example Hercules and all that so For the idea of a hero, it's pretty much
so <clears throat> if we were to say this is pretty much you know a chart I'm drawing here to explain uh, the context in which I, I would, I'm poetically saying the DNA is they like I'm trying to explain uh, where the heroic archetype comes from <clears throat> But first, I'm explaining to you that when I look at reality, this is where it was just the world. And then at some point, some point, the world became, I would say, this would be the world, and this is the self. And this is unconscious. A lot of people say imagination isn't real, but because consciousness is where reality is happening, it cannot be ignored as an ex engagement of consciousness. You see, it's like right now as I'm giving this talk, my physical body is just existing here. But simultaneously, I am aware that uh, where my thoughts are, where my memories and imagination is, is it's still in a part of the moment, but ultimately I am the space of my being. Right, so to me, my mind is a space where the content of it is a part of the content of my mind is being identified as me, right? Because it, it doesn't really matter if the sight started from the eyes or the sight started from above your head. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, <clears throat> I'm pretty much saying that I am what consciousness is, is how space is being alive as us. And the content of the space is matter. So, a duality emerged. So, technically, what I'm saying is hero is a concept that exists in duality. Also, a concept that is humanized. It's also a concept that has a value for the future. is also a concept that accesses the future <coughs> through imagination. That means heroic people have an incredible imagination. That's why they can even care for the outcome of an event. Ultimately, a concept that is a conscious, experiential response to the moment. Pretty much, guys, my, what I'm realizing now is any effort in consciously, experientially engaging something has a certain uh, aura of heroism to it. So pretty much the new is heroic. Not just its endurance of, let's say, the judgment of the past. We 
have reached an incredible time in human history where the human being can consciously acknowledge that even though we are physical organisms on the planet, we are simultaneously inside this language simulation, inside a linguistic simulation, and in this simu linguistic simulation, the language of imagination and its interaction with the world is through archetypes. <clears throat> the hero is one of these archetypes. It's another way of saying it's a state of being that is trying to keep the past alive in the future. That is the hero. And really, I would say the smartest heroes, or to me at least, if they were truly, let's say the most genius hero, would be a hero in some sense that prior to a need to sacrifice resolves. Right, a lot of people think the concept of sacrifice is important, right? And for a lot of people caught in an efficient system, it's likely that's a way for them to psychologically endure. But I would say, on a, and you know, there's these views, for example, Jordan Peterson says something very clearly. He says, uh, everybody has to make a sacrifice when you get to choose your sacrifice. And more than the future meaning of life, being important, I would say it's, it's a, what's also important is how we accept the road we have walked on, right? To me, you know, I had this moment where I realized that my inner realms, I am envisioning like different probabilities to my own future. And then I looked at my own past and I realized it's as if my, my karma is a road. Like this is something a lot of people don't say, you're not supposed to think you have karma. You're supposed to, in some sense, walk through your karma. Karma is like a road and we're walking through it, right? Through the dualistic experience of the nature of how consciousness experiences manifestation. <clears throat> Everybody on this planet, their body has changed. Their will change, their mind, in some sense, has changed. But even though a person can be trapped in moments of time, pretty much there's this idea in psychology that if it, let's say a child is experiencing riding a bike and just when it, the child is about to ride the bike, somebody takes the bike and the child can't ride it, right? So to that child, there's going to be an incomplete memory because the child doesn't have the, like, like a pure Kantian, you know, conscious reasoning yet. So it's as if like most people actually the younger you are, the more emotional you're interacting with reality. But the more the alphabet of perception in some sense solidifies and the person sees that what we have done in the efforts of academia has been to actually create an incredibly complex categorization system. And so what the human being does is it's like it finds something, it, 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 it like sees all the pieces, pretty much it's like, <clears throat> imagine like, you know, walked outside and you saw some like alien spacecraft debris or something, right? Some alien, some alien technology, right? You would, how would you understand it? You would first see how it works without any interference. Then the concept of like those people breaking the atom, they're simultaneously interfering with the, the, the property of that phenomenon, right? <clears throat> it's like how somebody Sorry guys, my attention just for a second drifted. Um, when we are younger, it's an emotional language, right? And there's moments that could be incomplete. I, I realized a lot of my character traits. It's, it's like this thing where like a human being wonders how they're being who they are and realizes 
their view on the present is actually how they have experienced their past. You know? <clears throat> Every person's character, like any person's behavior, can be considered on some sense. Like, okay, this person is how is this being conscious entity experienced its past? But once you realize, like, the past is defining you, and you realize that the present is being you, and it's also defining you. The only thing where man has free will to actually choose is in some sense what what outline of a future it wants to in some sense walk towards. Right? There's views on life, guys, that life is too big to do anything about. But at the same time, it's as if the human being is conscious. This is a rare opportunity simultaneously. You know, it's as if like humanity, humanity woke up from two different types of slumber, you know. The first slumber was it woke up from existence. The second slumber was it woke up in some sense uh, to experience, right? So it would be like, it would be like saying when you look at <coughs> like, you know, bacteria, under a microscope or cells under a microscope you know the cells move but we don't attribute any personality right it's like nobody has ever said like you know an, like a cell is funny you know it's like your white blood cells have a sense of humor like no, I think never that statement is but kind of <laughs> like we don't apply it you know but we don't bring the human psychology to the atomic geometry of our perception or the, you know, micro cosmic perception. The human being is a sophisticated intelligence and every person is tasked with the discovery of what they are. Like, if, if somebody could repaint the actual world scenario, it would be as if, like, we're just a species that has arrived in this conscious ability to act, to acknowledge the realm. And it's like, what do these conscious entities do, right? Like, it's as if we, do, even though we're calling ourselves human beings and, you know, we have flags and banners and all this, but on, on some very deep, true level of perception, it is too big and we have named our own truths in the void. And to me, all ideological systems are hilarious because they are all trying to capture, you know, or let's say if ideological systems could be like gas, liquid, solid, I would say solid ideological systems. They're trying to capture the shape of the world. You know, it's like, you know, what, what for example, religion is, is how a book became the whole world. Isn't it fascinating? It's like the power of books are like, you know, religious level. And so, you know, uh, it was also, I would say, so it would suffice, you know, that revelation occurred through language, right? Language is the divinity of the world, technically, what is moving it. <clears throat> and so what I'm trying to say is the human evolutionary psychology, anyways, it had to get to a point where the concept of duality had to be there, the human uh, memory and history had to be in place, language had to be created, you know. <clears throat> uh, it, it, it had to have an ability to imagine the future, right? It's as if like a person can't be religious really if they can't imagine a future, right? Because then the person won't have a system of morality. Without the future, it's like if the future wasn't important, it's like anarchy would bore itself to extinction. You know, the future is what we're all living for, and we don't. It's like we don't realize it.
right? But that's where everything is going. Pretty much it's like the idea is this. Anything that is manifest and visible, it is going towards the future. Anything that is not manifest and let's say invisible, it is in some sense where attention goes when the body is moving. You know, I looked at mysticism, guys, and I realized something we were saying, these ancient mystics, that made me completely have a different view on the on like what's the point of this world war. Right? And the attitude shift for me was simply this that the mystics were either all these ancient books or divine books to me even though some most religious people treat divine books as answers to me divine books are like expanding the question of the meaning of reality you know if somebody was like mr within what's the closest thing on this planet that is of a like closest thing to the gift from the gods and I would say it's speech it's like another way poetically the soul's attention can move from piloting the thing that I realized about ancient mysticism was like was that these guys were saying you are like a temporary being here but before you die wonder if you're eternal or not and that what started as like, you know, an Alice in, Wonder, in the Wind Wonderland kind of rabbit hole and suddenly turned into, for me, a completely different relationship as if your whole life you have been thinking you're an object, right? And then realizing that you are, excuse me, your whole life thinking you're a specific subject of an object that is being an object and suddenly realizing where the object and subject are happening. You see, it's like mysticism is, a, is, is another way of saying like enlightenment is an elevator to the ultimate state. The ultimate state of being as if before this periodic table that is us, you know, goes back to itself, right? Before the existent, existential performance is complete, could the performer realize the nature of why reality was here? You know, it's you know, it's it's as if like if life is a test, right? It's as if you know. I would say not a lot of people are looking at the questions. You know, I have this theory personally that in the geometry of any question the answer is there but the person has to have an ability to have a sort of spiral like view of uh, various angles to one phenomenon so let me you know, use this notepad a bit more We go to the concept of the DNA, and I would say <coughs> the most honest thing we could say about DNA is that it's the, okay here, a concept of how an unknown Honestly, the word manifestation is really important because it is man's eyes that are painted. You know, it's like humanity is a paint, and our consciousness going into uncharted territories of the cosmos. It's as if we're ambassadors of our nature. You know, that means on some level, it's like beyond all the storytelling something is here and something is happening and its presence is simple but its potential incredibly complex 
and it's as if like the psychology of the human being being like okay I thought this was temporary but what if as Alan Watts says waking up having never been asleep what if the fear of the void is causing us to ignore the nature of reality you see the concept of death and the concept of life if we were truly in a changing world would require to evolve but because these two concepts due to the existential reflection of what happens in life don't go away it's as if the mind is is poetically happening in a timeless dimension and the body is happening in time and that's why the mind can create time see it's as if just like a painter can use paint and the painter is beyond the paint right it's as if like poetically it's like in the background you know behind the background wallpaper of our mind <laughs> you know imagine like this is going to be like you know gurus in cyberspace like 200 years from now change the wallpaper of your minds you know future generations <laughs> It's as if like our DNAs had to have the concept of the future before we evolved and created language and came up with the concept of the future on the on a DNA level. The DNA is was a, is aware of the future before our mind is there. So I'll write here a concept.
good. Okay, okay. So what I'm writing here is that <clears throat> the DNA is aware of the future before the concept of the future in language could be recognized. What I'm trying to say is the DNA is aware of the future. I think I'm, I'm going to put this in the subtitle. Change the subtitle to this. The subtitle I had initially is what is protecting what from what. <laughs> you know, philosophers who cannot play with infinity and with the idea of infinity. It's like the mind that cannot play with the idea of infinity who cannot, you know, access philosophy. I'm telling you, philosophers are like, just like you have archetypes of people, you know, who are born like imbued with a nature like some people are born strong and some people are born weak if we saw that as sort of horizontal line from a vertical line some people are born and metaphorically i would say like some people are here to be uh, an eagle on a branch and some are here to be an eagle in the sky looking at the whole forest at once what philosophy is, is the flight of the attention that is being the mind from the ethno ethnocentrism and subjective shacklement of the past into a future where from the neutrality of the honesty of space then comes the structure of content in the mind. Right, so it's as if it's not it's not enough just for the person to think that they're do do meditating like how the ancient yogi said and they're gonna get enlightened. It's not an act. Like enlightenment is how you you realize death means everybody's leaving empty handed. And so in some sense the value of life is in some sense how much of the life actually lived on. Right? <clears throat> It's like our 
simple awareness of existence and the void at all is like the divinity in the world. You know? Man has sought for truth outside. Remember, the species is reaching the point where we realize that we don't, we're not just living an outer physical life. We're all living an inner non-physical life. The archetype of the hero, I, it, it's like every person's different, but I would say in my opinion, I have two, I have a couple words that I just give it, right? And in some sense, it is like originally a benevolence, right? And I would say, to me, it is efficiency, advancement, and the greatest advancement eventually is an archetype of benevolence. The most powerful beings on the planet, they, they don't own the planet. They are beyond the planet. I'm telling you, that's, the, that's what you realize when you read the Upanishads. You realize that there has been human beings on this planet where they have released their self into the world. It's as if the yogi, they're like, yogi, why are you meditating? Right, and the yogi is like, first of all, leave me alone, I'm meditating. <laughs> but the yogi says, in some sense, because I have to figure out why these eyes of mine are here. What greater spirituality do you look for? The question, we are being a giant question mark. No, we don't know what human nature is. You know, there's a mystery. Right, and there's a sophistication of, of the technology as well. Right, it's like you see a NASCAR like race, and you see it's like not only the driver is advanced, but uh, you know, like, excuse me, not only the vehicle is advanced, but the driver is also advanced. Right, it's as if not only the technology is incredible, but the users of technology are even more incredible because from a more superior dimension, we move it. Right. It's like the species has to realize that pretty much the choice is coming towards uh, the color gray and the color green. These two colors are fighting it out for the future. And it's a poetic way of saying, you know, it, it's like, you know, we either escape the reality through technology or we accept reality before there could be any duality. You see, it's as if like in Sufi tradition, they had this saying, you hear it from poets like Hafez or Miatar, where they say to die before you die. Even Saint Francis of Assisi has this quote where he says it is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. That means this ideological this character and story idea we have of ourself that is containing our consciousness, the instant we realize it's not there and it's like behind our eyes, behind our uh, object and subjective, uh, objective and subjective uh, existence, it's as if we are an unknown watcher and when you feel the, how unknown your own eyes are in an unknown world, what used to be the fear of knowledge for the unknown translates into, in some sense, the opportunity of the ability of an unknown self in an unknown world. It's as if, like, we feared because we were the small and the big, and it's like the shift realizes everything is big. That means right now, you know, on some physical level, yeah, I'm just a person on my balcony, but it's like, on another level, I am being part of this universal selector. And the less I have an idea of myself, I realize there's a deep, direct experiential rhythm that in poetically, when we're conscious, we pass through it, but when we're not conscious, it passes through us. That means think as if every person is allotted a sort of advanced capability, and it's as if in their life, just like how a seed has a design of what kind of tree it will be, it's as if like similarly, It's like human consciousness and the soil of space. And through the utilization of light, is, it's, it, what I'm trying to say is like, what we are, we will end up being. And the whole idea is what happens for the level of consciousness. 
right? Because consciousness is, is like uh, the most honest thing, right? We know we are conscious. I'm like right now, I'm conscious of my biological existence, and I'm also conscious how my mind is being a sort of effort right now, and I'm also conscious that this effort, it's in the background, starts from an emotion, and I'm also conscious where that emotion came from before I had it. So what I'm trying to tell you, the simplicity of, of how free the uh, uh, sight being space is. It's like when the species surpasses dualistic fear, there isn't a sort of, you know, an infinite efficiency rate, you know. My grandfather, uh, I remember when I was young, my brother and all my cousins, you know, he called all of us and he told all of us, whatever you want in your life, want the greatest. But he just said that to us, you know. <laughs> and we all went back, you know, playing and all of this. But then I thought about if somebody had such an ego where they were like, I want the greatest, what would the greatest greatness that somebody can want be? And I realize it leads to a collective vision. That means all individuals are living to participate in a collective realm. I'm telling you, what it, what it means is that there's great collective events that are going to happen in the future. And in some sense, the species' psychology, as it shifts, it's pretty much like, imagine on the planet right now, there's like, let's say, 80% indecency and 20% decency. Let's say when this comes to 50% decency or 50% indecency, it's like there's enough to see the whole picture, you know? So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it's, it, the future is going to go towards an ideological freedom, which most likely is going to be an instant emotional. It's like right now we're tunneling through language and thoughts, but in the future they're just going to tunnel through emotions. So pretty much it's going to become like a very fast-paced emotional entity. So imagine right now, let's say a person's walking by and they hear like somebody say the word apple, okay? And then in their mind, they see an apple, they see a picture of an apple, or they see a memory of an apple, or they just see an apple in their mind. They visualize an apple, right? Instantly the mind visualizes it when the word apple goes in the ears of the person, right? So now it's like what I'm trying to say, In, in this ability for the mind to instantly bring the picture of the apple, in the future generations, they're going to be able to extract from language instantaneous emotions because the language is instantaneously turning into an event where their psyche relates itself to. Right? It's the strange thing that anything we care for, we become emotional about. Isn't that strange? It's like our emotions are linked with this deeper knowing of, of like what needs to happen, isn't that? There's something here, you know, it's as if the DNA has been a mask, you know, for, you know, the spirit of a generation. For me, I, I feel that we have reached a time in history where it's going to help everybody that we start acknowledging that the human being is multidimensional. In being multidimensional, it's another way of saying just like, like the internet and cyberspace is another world, imagination is also another world. And it is only through the medium of communication where inner realms can be shared and in some sense, bridges can be made. Pretty much if somebody says, Mr. Within, what would advanced communication look like? Advanced communication would look like how instantly two inner realms could acknowledge a bridge and point. And 
some people even if you're in the wonder of language they wonder it's like what do we do with body language you know and body language is how the earth is designed not to lie nature is not dishonest you know it is it is instinctual it reacts instinctually like what separates he civilized human beings from animals is that animals instantly react they unconsciously react like they it's like they just if something comes close to the animal the animal growls the animal is like a program you know like this genetical program you go near it it growls you know <laughs> it generates sound this genetical program generates sound yeah <laughs> But it's an unconscious reaction. The ability of the human being, really, this is why our ancestors wore hats. Like, legit, they wore hats because they were like, this is what's separating us from the beasts. This is why we put on clothing, you know. You know, it was the heroism of an entity that had become conscious to be capable to actually properly separate itself. You know, what it is, is that what what a civilization is is how a planet is, is is what a planet is dressed in you know literally what's happening on the surface of it the heroic spirit comes the moment the person sees that something better is possible and, and like any amount of effort but the moment something's possible the effort is implemented you know and I have this vision where I, I, I don't know how I realized this, but it was like the biggest thing, one of the most life-changing thing. And I would say I, I noticed in my karma compared to others is that when I try to solve a problem, I start from a timeless position. Most people, when they look at a problem, they already have emotions of it. You know, it's as if when you look at, uh, let's say you want to analyze a concept, what you're actually looking at is like the shape of an idea. And the idea is shaped through a dualistic relationship of concept context, right? Everything is like this. Anything that a person wants to understand, you don't just have to understand what it is. You have to understand its utility, right? It's as if it's not enough to just say, okay, we understood the formula, let's say for the mind or something, or we, or we understood like how the mind is happening. Great, but now what do we do with it, right? So it's the ability to use what is there, but to use it in the most efficient context. And the efficient context would be that you are such an advanced being that you don't need to be dishonest, cruel, violent. These are unnecessary when the archetype is advancement. Right, and under the, those who are, I would say, old souls in advancement, right? Pretty much the concept in traditional spirituality of the young soul, old soul. I just titled them Advanced Communicator and Pilots of Consciousness. Pretty much the idea is that uh, some, some types of intelligence that is occurring through human frameworks on this planet, they're actually not from an ideological position. And it's like the, it's like pretty much when a person trusts the existence, they automatically start trusting their experience. When they trust their experience, if they remain honest, they realize there's an unknown variable to the moment. Because there's an unknown variable to the moment, no amount of certainty can complete the situation. So it's, it's another way of saying, like in the middle of nowhere it's like sentences are being writ sentences are being written on an empty page civilization is happening and we can understand the ink but it's like we don't understand why the empty page is there right we can understand everything about the known observable universe and we'll be like what do we do with that giant black hole in the middle of our universe you know <laughs> You know, imagine, you know, science, you know, as somebody who's a science teacher, it's like kids, you know, imagine young kids who don't know what a black hole is, right? The teacher's like, all right, kids, I want everybody to relax and for a moment take this in, right? There's a giant black hole in the middle of our universe and we think that we know that we give certificates in an unknown universe who believe that. 
aliens would look at the educational system and be like, this is some advanced politics. So. <laughs> Freedom. Without freedom, what exploration can be done? You know, it's like, are the children of the future generations being told to behave like the past? Or is there something that every person has never existed before? And what will their great performance be? And how will they sing their song of, I would say, the songs of, it, uh, of an advanced civilization? You know, pretty much, I am giving life to the performer archetype in the world by saying that an advanced future means we all we have already won. You know, there's this saying, I think it's in Habakura, the Book of the Samurai, where he says, the warrior that is already victorious in his mind and then he still steps onto the battlefield, that great warrior wins. In life, if honesty allows one to experience their original abilities and their original abilities activate based on the trust they have so it's as if a person has not uh, trained their attention to be able to watch an emotion rather than to be its unconscious reactive animation there is a mystery behind all of our eyes and it's it, it's this is this may sound bizarre but i guess i'll say poetically survival is a distraction for how unknown actually everything is and this is the coolest vibe because the unknown means nobody knows and at the same time everybody can know you know <clears throat> you know there, there's something i've often pondered wondered about is that you know i remember seeing this scene from the avengers movie and thanos goes to iron man and he says you're not the only one cursed with knowledge right and i think iron man tells him to like shut up or something i don't know <laughs> i don't remember the exact dialogue afterwards <coughs> But the idea is that there comes a burden with becoming more and more conscious of the world. It's as if you're trying to honestly be the whole world and you realize the more actually you have this context, the more you're going to experience emotions of collective fields of will. That means unless the human being has an incredible ability to witness its emotions, be detached from its emotions, it can't really use its imagination because the moment it uses its imagination, the, a scene comes that makes it emotional, it, the person jumps into kind of like, <clears throat> you know how YouTube has autoplay and it keeps jumping to random videos, like it becomes like it, that's what happens through an emotion unless the person wields their emotion and if you can wield your emotion then you become a very creative individual because wherever your attention goes the true nature of your creative being emerges you know? and it's very important to seek an honesty prior to how our desires can define us you know, it's as if everybody's inner child was like a name, unnamed viewer of just you know, you know. <coughs> Imagine like somebody, you know, a psychologist says to someone, find your inner child and the person's like, okay, I found it, but it's like it has no name or it's uh, anything, right? It's like me before I was named, right? It's like that memory. And then the psychologist is like, okay, not that, that, that early. <laughs> it's hilarious that we, it's like we're born in existence. 
then as the brain matures, the child is consciously born in an ideolog in an experiential realm. It's another way of saying the moment we can be an individual to our own world, then we can be an individual in the world in front of our eyes. But some people who can't be an individual behind their eyes, <clears throat> they are still trapped in an unconscious reaction to a dualism. And so, to be honest, pretty many people don't realize, but the yin yang symbol is an incredible metaphor of how two universes of chaos and order not only are they within one another, but they're within one circle. Right? It's as if the ultimate judgment is who realized this whole world was instantly existing. You know, some people think like mysticism is like a glitch in the matrix, you know. But I would say no, mysticism is like, you know, the programmer realizing how his fingers were moving his karma. It's the inner viewer, pretty much the Vedic thought, yogic thought. You know. This is not taught in universities because really unless the human being has an ability to identify as a universal being, their mind will be playing games with the idea of concepts. Like, I don't know how to say it, it's like a certain point of mysticism, it becomes <clears throat> a sort of untouched contentment with how there's a view at all, you know. Imagine somebody who tried their best and then all that they could do was just, you know, watch how the moment is being. Honestly, what it is, is that pretty much knowledge is a storytelling machine. And we're looking for stories that paint abstract events. And we're trying to relate those to stories that coordinate, which are synchronized with like outer events. You know? <coughs> Guys, I'll share a story with you. In 2016, uh, I had a chance to go back to the country I was born in in Iran, and gathering happening this kind of sp spiritual gathering in quotations <clears throat> and it was underground this place and you know various people you know dressed in suits and ties you know they were there and pretty much the, I, they had this sort of kind of spiritual narrative where they were saying okay there's a list of guest speakers and each guest speaker has the title master in front of their name And it was like this moment where it was like, I was like, no way, so many masters in one room, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I remember I see different people go and speak and nobody talks about the idea of the soul and there's this sort of artificial showing respect to like somebody being a master of their subjective mind or something, you know? <clears throat> so it was pretty much they had this and when I say master it would but in a Vedic way it was like it would be like equivalent to the idea of like guru this guru that it was like a title right and so I remember at the end you know <clears throat> some they were they asked me to speak and they said you have 10 minutes and I finished it at eight <laughs> you know and I wasn't even aware that it was like the time was gone <clears throat> But what happened is that I remember I just told everybody in that room that the whole point of the idea of like an enlightened being or an enlightened master is simply that the enlightened guru's job 
is to, to show you your inner guru. Because if the enlightened guru is just like, how would I say it? it it's as if like your greatest teacher is what you are being, right? And so it's, I, I was, okay, here, I'll go back to this. Pretty much what I said there, and the video's recorded, but it's in a different language. Uh, I think it's episode 438. <clears throat> but anyways, pretty much I tell them that your only guru is your moment of being because it is the only thing that has been with you from the beginning. Right? That was the last sentence I ended it off. And I got it. There was a bit of applause, you know. <clears throat> and I was like, people are being, you know, too kind. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, it's going back to the unconscious. Experientially, we're wondering what's going to happen to the content of the imagination after, let's say, the person physically transitions. If Rene Descartes' mind-body dualism, substance dualism is accurate, and we have this consideration that the imagination is happening not just in a different uh, it's not just a part of the brain, but it's like how there's another dimension to exist, to the world. <clears throat> you know, it's like a part of the explanation of imagination would be how not only its capability is found in the brain, but how its capability is also right. It's, a, it's arising from the world, right? True mysticism is you start acknowledging that the world is alive, and so for the first time, it's as if you know, if you have thought of life through a soulless universe it's like the universe has a soul and that means it, it is worthy to consciously acknowledge honor and communicate right i'm not t saying that people should think they're talking to god but i'm saying like <laughs> that's like too there's too much of that archetype what i'm saying is like people have to just realize the free will is a pilot and we're piloting through the space-time continuum based on your height and based on where your eyes are and eventually if you live in this world enough in the conscious waking state you'll eventually realize your fullest freedom is how the moment is allowed to be itself and when you allow the moment to just be itself there is no identification of the narratives of value it's as if all your emotions on the outer realm they kind of return back within and then it's as if like you free yourself from the world and you free the world from yourself and the idea is is that technically what i mean by that is that we it's like the greatest honor is the on un unknown being able to acknowledge it's <coughs> It's like mankind is another way of, you know, uh, from a religious narrative is another way of, let's say, God's quality check of his own invention. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
really what it is is that um, the void has a shape and when we realize beyond the shape of existence the mystery of our own lives right? it's as if like isn't it a great idea for everybody on this planet everybody listening to me it's like <clears throat> buy notebooks buy a notebook put it right beside your bed you know or buy a stack of printer paper and put it on a table where you pass by often and in some sense to write is another way of saying to allow the inner realms to move the outer realms when usually it's the opposite space is the freedom of awareness beyond shape and because space is that means prior to changing shapes being the definition the presence of being it's like it's like a person realizes their whole body is born but their mind is unborn and so there's a sort of kind of laughter a laughter of the gods and, and, and through the eyes of course it itself which is another way of saying chaos and order and simulation ends and for the first time you find yourself in a world where the concept of chaos and order pretty much being a suggestion of how your memory has happened so far it's as if we we access a pure moment of being and from the pure moment of being it's as if like letting emptiness be emptiness and then through that trust and ultimate contentment with the simplest principle of reality you know that the species no longer needs to freak out from the void you know it's just the you know one of those unique things happening in this part of the you know manifestation you know universes <clears throat> where inside them there's manifestation and then imagine a manifestation of all universes at once you know you know and the moment we act we can attribute consciousness to what we see it's like we can attribute consciousness to the archetype of an infinite being. We can attribute consciousness to the archetype of the site of a universal being. It's as if right now, an answer to who's looking through my eyes or through the eyes of everybody in the species, it would be as if it's the whole universe. You know? It's like right now I am being as much as I'm being, you know, a human being. A, a, a person with a subject and a name. I am also being a universal event. And the f through the recognition of that comes an ultimate freedom from the world. You know? It's kind of strange, you know? It, it, it's like what we... <clears throat> it's ultimately how attention moves. That's really what intelligence is. Okay, 
So, um, guys, for the next episode, I'm just gonna find a tutorial on YouTube and fix all these audio issues. So, bear with me through this episode. I don't know, we're alive in this, you know, this lifetime, things happen once. Every day that we live and then we sleep, it's as if like there's a sort of leveling up, like the brain have received, consumed more perception. And it's as if on some level, what is the ultimate command of this universal cycle? You know, it's like as a universal being, you're like, have I been identifying with a pebble and a light beam this whole time? It's like, what is this place? You know, it's like, where is, it, it, it's like, it's not a place called Earth. It's a place called, where is the Earth? Just the fact that we have imagination means like okay there's something there like imagination is like the most simplest proof of like there's something more than physical reality you know i mean anybody who has an imagination right even like language use it's like we're, we, we are living as a multi-dimensional being even language and definitions of the dictionary have multiple definitions right so it's like it's the, the species needs the honesty to realize it has always been acting like a multi-dimensional being and it's as if what has been what has our attention been filtered uh, through by modernity for me it's it's this strange scenario where the world can't become too much of a chaotic place and it can't become too much of an ordered place right and so it's this idea where somebody could be like Mr. Within when you talk about an advanced civilization. Is this like, you know, the Tower of Babylon or something? Is it one of those things? And I'll be like, in, in the idea of an advanced civilization, the most advanced idea is freedom to all, right? So it would be as if like only a being that is ultimately free can give ultimate, like, freedom, do you know? <laughs> I don't know if there's another way I can rephrase this, like, <laughs> there is no, here's the thing, it, it's like, um, the origin of attention is unknown, that's the edge of knowledge, the moment we reach the edge of knowledge, we realize the duality where the character and the story archetypes have been moving around, right? It's like that's not the whole show, and there's deeper dimensions to life. Then I would say it's like we transition from thinking we, we are this idea of a self into an unknown explorer of every moment of being. You know, it's as if as if the concept of, of boredom was eradicated by how mysterious the realm was to that every action is like something new happening in the space time continuum. You know? <laughs> and what's the most advanced movement of it? So pretty much, guys, I'll, um, let me get to the end of this episode. Uh, I'll say whoever you are, you know, just for a moment, close your eyes and just honor your DNA. <laughs> just honor your existence and, like, why it has arrived, right? The past gives us reasons, in some sense, to... How can I tell you? It's as if, like, the past is chaos and the future is order.
and every day a person wakes up, it's like the order of their world is, is, is new. It's being reorganized. It's like, what are we doing? It's like creatures changing in a psychological simulation of reality and thinking that we're, we're just the shape of, like, we're just the object. You know, it's like we're, we're definitely, like, more advanced than just existence. Because there's an awareness to it, right? It's as if something with intelligence is moving on the surface of the earth. It doesn't get alien, more alien than that, you know? <laughs> and I don't know, I'll tell you this, the moment I, for me, the concept of the vision of an advanced civilization became like the legend, the archaic revival of the legend of the kingdoms and the clouds. Ultimately, I'm just some guy talking about castles in the sky, like we should build them. <laughs> Anybody who supports this podcast is investing in that future, you know. <laughs> and who knows, you know, that's the coolest thing about life, that no moment of simulated meaning can capture a changing world. It's like, what are we doing? say language is like how in the conscious waking state we as creatures found a way to share what is behind our eyes like that is some advanced <laughs> you know it's like we were destined to become it's like fiction was the destiny of nonfiction, or the destiny of nonfiction is fiction you know It's like, a, imagine like a dolphin jumping in and out of the water. Right now we think we're finite objects in the realm, and then we realize we're like infinite subjects in the realm. We're the spirit of how, it's like what we think is the mind that we personify through the body, like through the idea of the body. It's as if what it is, it's that it's like a bunch of mighty forces at work. So it's this poetic view where in certain spiritual contexts people, context, people believe in the idea of past lives, but if you wonder about what is looking through the eyes of a human being in a changing world, it's as if poetically every day uh, is a reinvention of your soul. You know, that's what's happening actually. We are tunneling through how our memory projects the future and gives us an internal dimension of movement before an external one. Imagine there's the art of a changing world and then there's the art of changing the world. Everything is just like we're tunneling through this dualistic contact, like, like an outline. It's like, for how long is the species going to be like, you know, good and evil are, ex are going to exist? This is to me one of those deep philosophical questions. Like, I think in like 200 years, people are going to get bored of chaos and orders repetition. We're going to try to we're going to accept the duality of our physical existence, our situation of the cosmos, but internally, we're not just dual, right? So imagination, it's like somebody visualizing something being empty, that's like imagination technically. You know, somebody visualizing everything being one thing, that's imagination, right? Everyone, somebody imagining what infinity would look like, you know, or like something accelerating faster than the speed of light would look like. 
in the future there might be an advance, like this might be like the destiny of all advanced civilizations, an advanced civilization that's faster than its definer factor, like light. It's like, you know, who knows, maybe there was an advanced civilization in all the other planets, but they had advanced to a point where they didn't need to be manifest entities. You know? And, you know, for me, they say man is made in the image of God, and you know, sometimes when we look at the idea of man, we're like, okay, let's, let's be traditional and say body, mind, soul. Okay? And so then the person's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, could the world have a body, mind, and soul? Right? And technically, it's like the body of the world is a physical manifestation. The mind of the world is technically how there's a whole thing is like a field, like awareness of itself. It's like an activity of a field. Right? This is like, it's like, I think this is the closest thing uh, to an enlightenment where the idea of enlightenment doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, where it reaches this point where what is being is already being before it has a systematic approach to its world. I don't know what it is, but it's like the path of least effort sometimes reveals the efforts of the realm. Like there were shamans back in the day, they would get like a wooden bowl, they would put a bunch of stuff in it, like rocks, branches, I don't know, like eagle claws or something, you know, and then they would throw these, right? <clears throat> Imagine like, I don't know, whatever object they would put in the bowl, I don't know, like maybe like a fruit or something. <laughs> But anyways, they would throw all that stuff on the ground and they would stop for a second all their thoughts. They would watch that singular event and they would notice the first thought that would come to them. You know, that's the shamanic experience, right? It's an ability not to just be content with the unknown. Not that you're content with the unknown, you're aware of your space of being. And so creativity moves in the boundaries of freedom. That means without freedom, it's like, what, what creativity? You know, it's, it's like in an unfree world, people thinking they're free. It's like, how marvelous, you know? <laughs> and my strategy is like, in the inner realms, we're going to live in a free world. And do you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the whole idea. But what is the greatest view that the species deserves? And it's the activation of its greatest potential. I don't know how else, what else there is to say. Do we want to see uh, our eyes traveling infinitely? Or I should rephrase and say, do we want to see DNA? And if we go, does DNA want to go on an infinite journey? Does it want to go beyond its infinite shaped life? We start off from a known personality and if we realize the unknown presence of being, that is the honesty of the first divinity. I would say the most important you know, divine view to me is how memory, imagination, all that is existing in the moment for a second just bows to the potential of the world. It's as if the, the imagine a person who was shouting, not for, let's say, <clears throat> you know, uh, stories of God. But a person who was shouting and was actually talking, like imagine somebody literally prayed, or I shouldn't say prayed, but let's say somebody shouted to uh, the potential 
of this infinite be changing out. It just it's like shouting to the universe. Remind yourself of your own. There is a quote I want to read. It's from Farid al Dinatar and the song. Okay, so while I find that, there's a quote from Attar, he says, If the eye of the heart is open, in each atom there will be 100 secrets. Okay, here. This is the, I found the poem. So, Farid al-Din Attar, Attar of Nishapur, he's like, pretty much, I don't know what it is, like 700 to 1,000 years ago. 700, 800 years ago, let's say. <clears throat> and this guy was like this Sufi mystic, you know, and in that culture, a sort of liberated individual, somebody who had, had found the pearl, pretty much. It would be like, it's enlightened. And he says, <clears throat> this is his poem, he says, <clears throat> The home we seek is in eternity. The truth we seek is like a shoreless sea, of which your paradise is but a drop. This ocean can be yours. Why should you stop, beguiled by dreams of evanescent dew? The secrets of the sun are yours. Would you content yourself with moats trapped in its beams? Turn to what truly lives, reject what seems. Which matters more, the body or the soul? Be whole. Desire and journey to the whole, spelled with the capital W. It's another way of saying the journey of individual consciousness is the twist towards the supremacy of all of it. It's like the greatest ego and advance to the world. It would be the ultimate destiny of all egos and from all like for all species and beyond all potential planets. It's as if they look at <coughs> the void and what is the retaliation of the great performance of species, you know, towards a sort of you know galactic advancement, poetically. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I've, this episode has gone long enough. For a, for like a minute, I'll post this here, where the video is gonna be. Anyways, <coughs> thanks for listening, and um, you know, honor the heroism of how all your ancestors, all their decisions have become you, you know, have led to this moment. It's another way of saying, like, the journey of DNA, you know, some fragment of the original, you know. It's, like, remarkable what's actually happening. It's like a genetical program. And this genetical program through is using consciousness to expand its survival. So technically, if we build interstellar cities and we overpopulate the whole universe with people in advanced civilizations and planets, and imagine there was this great AI that would go on and build you know, you know advanced habitable civilizations before we overpopulated the whole universe and like with the human archetype.
it's either we're like overpopulating the outer realms or we discover the nature of our inner realms. Pretty much it's like how long does this creature first the question was like how long is this creature going to be an object and that changed through language acquisition and evolution and so now it's like how long is this species just going to think it's a subject based on an object then it's going to evolve to thinking it's a subject separate from the object then it's going to evolve to realizing it was never a subject and the mystery keeps going and going until we realize the world the only way we can truly know it is by experientially being with it as it happens. So it's as if every moment of the conscious waking state, it's as if the unknown is shown to be reality. You see, that's, it's as if there's a divinity to how our eyes are even open. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. And uh, If I was to give a sentence to this wallpaper, to the picture of this video, I would say, you know, love beyond the crown. That means the intellect realizes there's something more and it can suffer if it doesn't attempt it or it doesn't realize it. It's like the purpose of the intellect is to master the outer realms pretty much like intelligence is here to feel like it is in control of all of the outer universe. We all act like hum humble people, but the way the brain is working is that it's trying to conquer the meaning of the world by using all of our memories to make the moment have, like, you know, interlink subjects to objects about the meaning being there. There's a big grand mystery, it's like we're a living mystery, you know, and uh, if we can be aware of how we're being before we do anything, I think that's where, that's the divine clue. A moment that was free before it couldn't be. And the greater responsibility, imagine when a person says they they feel like they're a universal being. It's like with that comes universal responsibility. That means poetically, let's say all the other planets, they had civilizations on it and there was a diplomacy between all these planets. As if, if imagine like a, a planet was being invaded imagine jupiter was being invaded and all the other planets in the solar system all the advanced civilizations would in, in, in instantly assist right imagine like a solar system's unification right The world is a magnificent uh, event. It's like consciousness is an event because the world is moving. There's a, let me find this other quote I want to read for the viewers. Sargadot Maharaj says, just sit and know that in quotations you are the in quotations I am. Without words, nothing else has to be done. Shortly you will arrive to your natural absolute state. Srinu Sargadot Maharaj says, I am the self, the witness of consciousness and pure awareness. It's like we need. I wish, like, you know, somebody could go to the United Nations and read that, you know, on some podium. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, some, like, it's like for the first time they bring, like, you know, a philosopher and the philosopher starts reading, you know, endless quotes of wisdom, like, for the United Nations. <laughs> and 
Shin Sargidat Maharaj says most of our karma is collective. We suffer for the sins of others as others suffer for ours. Humanity is one. We could have been much happier people ourselves but for our indifference to the suffering of others. Or excuse me, we could have been much uh, happier people ourselves but for our indifference to the suffering of others. Shirin Asargadad Maharaj, there's like a questioner asking him, what about the importance of meditation? Shirin Asargadad Maharaj says, the only thing which anyone has is the conviction that one exists, the conscious pre presence. Meditation is only on that sense of presence, nothing else. Yeah, he's saying just like, be the origin of your consciousness instead of the end. Srinas Arghadat Maharaj says, I am the self, the witness of consciousness, pure awareness. I am not an object in consciousness, but its source.